It doesn't mean that once in a while you don't show them an act of compassion, forgiveness. It doesn't mean you don't inspire them. But those are the footnotes. When you go out on a date and your date keeps playing with his phone or her phone and they're distracted, how's that going to make you feel? As opposed to going out with someone who just glued to you. The first person makes you feel irrelevant. That pisses you off. If I'm that goddamn uninteresting, why the hell did you ask me out on a date? The second one, what do you do? Oh, he looked at me and listened to me for five hours. Man, I love him. Yeah, you love him only because he listened to you. You know what a tax collector is? They don't really care for you. What they care for is what they can get out of you. It's called friendship. It's called companionship. Am I really to believe that you're here because you like the way I look? Some of you do, of course, and I don't really blame you. Am I to believe that these ideas inspire you and these inspirations are going to turn into a want and hopefully a need? No, of course not. You're here. You're curious. You're a little confused. You're a little fascinated. They don't have much shelf life. It's like milk. Once the semester is over, two weeks later, it's finished. Why are you here? I appreciate you bringing me coffee. I appreciate the fact that you sit there some of you pretend, some of you generally are interested. You're respectful, dignified. It's all good. But let's be honest. You're here because you need three units. You also need this class because it is a transferable class. You need it for UC and CSU. And despite all the compliments you shower me with, at the end of the day, it's about the grade. You know how I feel about the way you guys write. You're far too young to understand what you're writing about. If you're really here to understand, let me fail all of you. That will show me that you're really interested in ideas and you're not a tax collector. But you see, that's not the case. So next time you pick up the phone to call a friend, know that you do it because you're bored. It doesn't mean you don't like your friend. But you're doing it really because you're bored. Don't get me wrong. There are these magical moments in our life where... You get consumed by passion, i.e. love. Or you really, really like the person. And you don't even know why. It's just an emotion that consumes you. If you really, really, really want to be friends with someone, find someone who doesn't need you. Find someone whom you need, but make sure you know what that need is. Let me give you an example. This may kind of sound a little weird. But that's okay. You guys are adults. Imagine for a moment, and this is a hypothetical. 
It's fiction. Imagine one of you comes to my office and says, Amir, I really, really like you. Well, that's great. Well, you like me in what sense? Oh, you know, when I go home, I, I'm, like, when I leave the classroom, I think about you. So, okay. Like the ideas, oh, no, I just think about you. So, well, that's, that's nice. Uh, well, how long does that stay with you? Well, you know, when I'm driving home, I just, I, I can't get you out of my mind. And when I'm eating, I'm thinking about you. And, and then when I'm like shitting, I continue to think about you. And when I'm like with my boyfriend, I imagine it's you. I say, ooh, okay. So, and what else? Nothing. I just can't get you out of my mind. I say, listen, I really appreciate that. The truth is, I don't give a shit about you. Well, do you think if I leave my boyfriend, you and I can have a thing? I say, of course we can. But here's the thing you need to understand. And this is my comment to this person. You know, I'm 60 and you're only 20. There's like a 40 year age difference. Yeah, yeah, but you know, when you're in love, you don't see age like that. You don't see wrinkles. You don't see boldness. You don't see any of that stuff. I love you. So I, I appreciate that. But you know, I've been 20. I don't like 20 year olds. And you're 20, therefore, I don't really like you. I also know the immaturity of the way 20 year olds think. Therefore, I don't, not only do I not enjoy you, I don't even enjoy the way you think about anything. And about your feelings, I mean, 20 year olds, what the hell do they feel about? Their feelings are unrefined, they are raw, they're infantile, they're stupid. So I don't even like your emotions. Add to it, you're also a Westerner. You are shallow. You have no history, you have no culture. And then she says, I really want to be with you, what can I do? Say, okay, so this is what you need to do. First, you need to understand, you and I will never, ever, ever become physically intimate. Because I don't have those needs right now. Second, the only thing I need for you to do is to understand the way I think. But before you do that, you need to understand my culture. And if you want to get close to me, go somewhere, read books about Persian culture, Persian history. Two years later, come back and pay me a visit. Once you know a little bit about the Persian culture, once you know a little bit about Persian poetry, once you know a thing or two about Persian society, about how they've been, kind of their land and their people have been assaulted and raped for the past 4,000 years, and what that, that does to the cultural psyche, come back. Now what you need to know is me. You have the proper foundation now. You have knowledge of the culture. You have knowledge of the religion. You have knowledge of the philosophy. Now you need to know me. Let me tell you my experiences for the past 60 years. Once I tell you my history, then I say, okay, now I'm going to train you, teach you how to think. See, I'm not going to come into your world. Your world gives me nothing. It has zero value for me. But if you come into my world, by the time you're 25, you will think and feel like a 70-year-old person. Which means what? You will make less mistakes. You will make the right choices, relatively speaking. You will have less regrets. Fun. Oh, that depends on your interpretation of fun, your definition of fun. Mistakes give lessons. No, they don't. When you eat food, what happens, Camille? You digest. You don't digest anything. Your body does all the work for you. How about if your body is disabled? Can you digest well? It's very disabled. Can you digest well? 
Yes, food can taste really good from the tip of your tongue to the end of it, but the moment you swallow it, you need to go to Kaiser. Yes, you had pleasure. Yes, you had fun for five minutes. Now what? Misery for 12 hours. Oh, drugs can be fun. Don't get me wrong. You can smoke. The hell are you going to do with addiction later on? It's going to haunt you for 50 years. How are you going to overcome that? How about short-term memory? Well, if we're talking about my definition of fun, I wouldn't say that. Whatever the definition of your fun may be. Whenever you digest anything, anything out there, any impression out there is like food. If it's not physical, it's emotional. If not emotional, it's intellectual. If it's not intellectual, it's spiritual. You need a body that's able to digest it well. What's his question? Well, you weren't here. What do I do with responsibility? He's saying, I got this shitload of stuff on me. I got to think about them, feel about them. I can't digest them. So I walk around frustrated and angry on a daily basis. What's his question? I am eating shit on a daily basis. Is there a way to change? What he's saying is, I have the stuff, I have the food, I just don't know how to digest it. You have fun, like all of us in this class. Are you able to digest it well? Why do you think people have trauma? Why do you think people are depressed? Why do you think people are lonely? The world is like a buffet. Go eat whatever the hell you want to. Make sure you're able to digest it, man. You want to go out with a loser? Go out with a loser. Make sure you're able to digest his history. Because if you don't, his unhappiness will make you unhappy. His, your love for him will turn into my hate. You know Jesus Christ, where he can take shit and turn it into gold. What's the reason for the Bible? Dialogues of Plato. All these books, what are they there for? Why does your grandmother sit you down and talk to you about the difficulties of life? Because life is complicated. Well, you think Russell and I didn't get married because of love? Of course we did. We loved our companions. Russell and I, and you, we love our companions. Once in a while you have doubts. Of course. And as you get older, especially for you, see, we are settled. We know we're in shit. There is no escape for us. You, on the other hand, you're not there yet. You're in diarrhea, which means that you can swim away. But that's not what you're going to do. You're going to stay and stay and stay until it becomes shit hard, where you get stuck. And then you got to make difficult decisions. Stay or go. If I go, what's going to happen? My child, my parents, him, is he going to follow me? Is he going to do this or that to me? It's fun right now, but just wait. Now, let's unpack the definition of fun. Yuck. Do you have any questions before I continue? Anyone? Ethan. Come on, man. Give me a question. You look like that guy. Um, you know, Superman guy? Janae, please, please. He may interpret your excitement wrongly, and then you may be in trouble. Doesn't he? Are you Clark Kent? Can you love lift things? You sure? Clark? Do you guys know what's taking place in this classroom? Do you have any idea, you ungrateful beasts? No? I'm giving you 4,000 years of Persian culture. I'm giving you 60 years of experience. 
I'm giving you about 40 years of reflection. I'm giving you Costco. Costco. I'm not kidding you. <clears throat> you know, it's like uh, you're going somewhere and buying all 20 volumes of Harry Potter. And then you got to sit your ass down and just read. That's going to take you like 10 years. The other thing you can do is just go on YouTube and <laughs> watch the eight movies. It'll take you a day. Neon? You see this guy here? Right here. He's 7 Eleven. What can he give you? Bro, frozen burritos? Slurpee? She's Safeway. It's much bigger. Right? And you can enjoy yourself at Costco, 7 Eleven as well. But when you go to Costco, man, it's like you have entered a different universe. You know, you go to 7 Eleven, you're looking for mushrooms. You think they got mushrooms for you? No. Costco, I mean, uh, Safeway has mushrooms. You get a tiny little package of mushrooms, five bucks. You come to my store, man. I give you a bucket of mushrooms, two ninety nine. And most of it will go bad, of course, because you're a single man. You don't really know how to eat or cook. <sighs> do, you, do, you, do you or no? You sure? See, I can, when you come to me, man, as a Costco, I can entertain you for like days. He? <laughs> Ten minutes. She? Maybe a few hours. But that depends. Do you have membership? You don't have membership, man, so you can come to me. <laughs> well, you got to come and talk to me. You work at Starbucks, no? There you go, see? Membership. Now, this should be the bread and butter of every sort of way you think about yourself and life and all the things that you do. Physical. There are things that you do for your body. And it is fun. Mm, fun. It's a little cold, but fun nevertheless. It gives me pleasure. You don't go out with unattractive people. You go out with attractive people, physically. Why? You like looking at them. Then you mature a little and you say, you know what? I just don't want to go out with someone who just looks good, but is empty on the inside. I want someone who is emotionally mature. All of a sudden you say, sex here is fun, but I don't feel anything about the person. So you say, I want this, but I also want this. I want to make sure that the emotions are positive, not negative. They're not going to create shame, regret. I don't want to feel shortchanged. Okay? You so want sex. But now it comes with another component. I want to feel this man. Know that he respects me. He knows me. He gets me. Then you say, you know what? This is great and this is great. I want someone who thinks well, has an intellect that knows how to look at things, how to think about things, how to break things open. 
See what's inside. And whatever shitty emotions existed, they can come down with this tool called the mind and figure out what the hell is going on. See, some of you do that. You wake up and you're in a shitty mood. You say, check yourself before going to the classroom. Other people are not responsible for your nonsense. Grow up. And you come to a place where you say, I want to be in a relationship, but I want someone who feels well. They're not traumatized by their parents, but their prior experiences in life. I want someone who thinks well. So when I go home, they know how to be. I don't want to go home and be thrown all over the place because this guy doesn't know how to feel or think well. Then you say also, now remember, when you are immature, what usually happens is this. You do have a mind. But what you do is you say, what party can I go to that I can get the quickest sex, the quickest drugs, the quickest alcohol? So your mind is in the service of pleasing your body. And that's a shitty way of using your brain. Sometimes you're so angry, you say, I want to go somewhere, find someone who feels as shitty as I do, so him and I can sit and have a pity party. They can talk about their nonsense, I can talk about my nonsense. That's your brain in service of pathetic, infantile, negative emotions. You need to come to a place where you say, I think well, and I want someone who has a relatively healthy emotional history, physical history. I'm tired of going out with losers and talking about things that are irrelevant and ridiculous and infantile. <clears throat> then there is this part of you called the psychological part. It doesn't exist for all of us, but some of us. For me, the psychological part is a part that is called trauma. If you have had an experience that just lives inside you and is the foundation of who you are, let me give you an example. I had a friend... She was from Afghanistan. Uh, this is, oh, I don't know, almost 20 years ago. She was 11 in Afghanistan. Her uncle had abused her. She was molested at the age of 11. Repeatedly for some years. And she did not really know what to do with this. She told her mom, she was slapped. She told her father, she was slapped. Eventually they moved to America. But you must understand how difficult it is to process this experience when you're young. Okay? She wanted to understand, but she couldn't. She wanted to express, but she was rejected. So you have this lump, like cancer inside you, and it's growing. It's not a disease that's just going to disappear. It grows bigger and bigger and bigger. In Chicago, where she lived for about five years, the only thing that she knew how to do, and she was a very attractive young woman, she would have men fall in love with her. When she had them, she would tell them, get lost, I don't want to be with you anymore. And the men would be devastated. She went to Davis, became a doctor. She got married in hopes of getting rid of this memory, this experience. It lasted for only five years. And she would say to me, every time I sh I'm intimate with my husband, I feel as if it's my uncle laying next to me. That is what I call a trauma. 
It matters very little where you go, what you do. This thing follows you. It's like your shadow. You have moments of rest, moments of calm, moments of peace. But for the most part, it sticks its head out and says, I am here. Never forget that I've disappeared. Never forget that you have completely got rid of me. I'm always going to be with you. She is 50 and she is single. She will never be able to have a healthy relationship. Never. Because when you have trauma like this, you know what you do? You play the tape, you rewind, you replay it over and over and over and over again. And it changes the way you think about everything. You get married the first time. You stay, you do the best you can. Five years later, you end up in a divorce. You recover, hopefully, from it. You say, my second marriage will be better. But the percentage of those who divorce in their second, third, fourth marriages keeps getting higher and higher and higher. Why? Your tolerance for garbage decreases. And because you once made a promise, you realize you can hold the promise, you get out, you know that you can do it for the second time as well, and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth. And you get more and more jaded. Now that becomes psychology. There is a positive aspect to this as well. You have someone like Malcolm X. You have someone like Mahatma Gandhi. You have someone like Plato. They also suffer trauma. But the person who injects trauma into Plato is Socrates. The person who injects trauma in Matthew is Jesus. The person who makes you, puts trauma inside you is your grandfather sitting down saying, don't smoke, don't drink. And every time you do, they slap you. And then time passes and you say, man, I'm so glad my grandpa was there watching over me. You understand the trauma and its benefit only five or ten years from now. Initially, you'll hate them because they're making an obstacle. You can't go out and have fun. But five years later, you say, thank God he was there. Okay? Now, for those of you in this class who will get over the physical definition of fun, emotional fun, intellectual fun, psychological fun. You get to a place called spiritual. Everything we do in life, everything, it's either in this house or this house or this house or this house. If you like to read books, good books, you don't want to sit and talk to someone who just keeps rambling on about how their father was, how their mother was, unless... They want to put it in a Freudian way where your intellect, when your mind kind of wakes up and becomes engaged. Okay? So remember, if you get a two-year-old son, fun for him is going to the park. For you or 25, for example, you say, I want to watch a movie that makes me feel something, man. I don't want to go to the park. I want to feel. I want to watch Al Pacino. For those of you who just want to sit and think about certain things, why your father is the way he is, for example, you go read a good goddamn book on addiction. For those of you who are tired of this shit inside, you say, I want to figure out what trauma is and how it works through me. And as you see... Your definition of fun, i.e. pleasure, i.e. maturity, changes. And when you're here, you're not going to have too many friends down here or here. As you grow and mature, your world shrinks. You will have less people in your world. Okay? You pick and choose very, very carefully. Well... Another disastrous day. 
Do you have any questions or comments before we go home? Uh, Vivian. I think anything that is guided is good. You know, there are advantages, there are disadvantages. Uh, if you have, say, a father who's a pianist, and from age two, he's keep pushing you on playing the piano. Let me give you an example. There is, a, there is this kid on YouTube. His name is Paul, uh, Peter Buka. He's just like, he started posting his, uh, playing the piano, I think when he was 16 or 17. Man, this kid is immaculate. He is beautiful. Not that he does he look beautiful, he also plays beautifully. And he's very animated. And sometimes when I sit and watch him play, I am profoundly jealous. And I'll tell you why. See, most 17-year-olds, they have to, they kind of just flounder around. They have to figure out who they are, what they are, what they want to do. And they won't really figure anything out until they're like 60. This kid... He's got a brother who plays the violin. He's got a sister who sings opera. So he comes from a very creative background. And luckily for him, and good for him, his parents didn't give him too many options. They didn't send him to Costco. Son, you want to go to that aisle? Fine, that aisle, fine. He says, no, there's only one aisle, and that's called the piano. You sit your ass down, and you play. And now at the age of 17 or the 20-some, not only is he financially well off, he's rich, but he is creative man. He knows who he is. He is the piano man. He is nothing without the piano. I mean, most of us, our parents, I mean, myself included, we don't really have the time or the passion or the energy to bring focus to our kid's life. I'm still trying to figure out what the hell I want to do with my life. So the kids, for the most part, are obstacles. And so what happens? Well, they got to go to a two-year school, then a four-year school, then they got to figure out if they want to do history, psychology, philosophy, math, computer science. And then they got to figure out if they're going to get married to this person, that person, if they're straight, gay, if they're a man, woman, this, that, too many things. Right? Not Peter Buka. So if you have someone in your life who has figured a thing or two out for themselves, and if they like you enough, and if they see inside you potential, that you can reflect what they enjoy, okay? I mean, if someone in this class suddenly raised their hand and said, can we talk about video games because I'm at this, you know, playing this thing and I'm at this level. Can I, how can I get to a higher level? I say, listen, I don't give a shit about that question. Why? Because I don't see my own intellect in that question coming to life. If on the other hand, you raise your hand and say, I want to study philosophy. What do I do? I said, well, damn, look, I am a philosopher. She's saying she wants to do philosophy. I now see parts of me inside you. And then I'm going to examine you, your intentions. And I'm going to see how much money you got, who your parents are, where you live, what you do. Because if there are any obstacles in your life, I'm going to take a few steps back. Why? Because my energy ultimately is going to go to waste. So if you have someone in your life who is good at something, and they look at you and they see their own reflection, that you can be just as good as a pianist, follow them. If you don't, what's going to happen is you got to just walk around the lake and figure out something. And that's going to take you a long, 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 long time. Listen to your parents. Always. Why? Your mom got married for love. She came to taste firsthand that love is not the answer to a good relationship. So when you go home, tell your mom, I'm in love, and she says, fuck you, listen to her. It's not that she doesn't understand. She understands really, really well. When you say to your mom, I don't want to go to school, and your mom slaps you, man, that's a blessing coming your way. Thank you. Okay? Why? She knows the value of money. She knows the value of youth. She also knows that if your mind is uneducated, 
there's a good chance that your companion, you're going to choose someone who's as ridiculous as you are. And that's not going to pay off good for you in life. Look for people who have experience and have been seasoned by experience. There is nothing wrong with fun. As long as you know what kind of fun you're having. When we come back next week, Tuesday, we'll talk some more about something. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.